Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Ben Katz. I'm the political director for Open San Diego. Open San Diego is the local affiliate of Code for America. We, we help government and nonprofit organizations use technology better. Um, here with uh, Carl DeMaio, a former city council member and uh, candidate for Congress. Carl, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, looking forward to a really good conversation about technology and, and the potentials it holds for government. Um, I think, think we have a lot of common uh, experiences and some, so I think it's going to be a great, great conversation. Well, this is a topic I'm, I'm really passionate about and it's not a partisan topic. I mean, we can disagree on policy. Uh, we can actually even disagree on priorities of problems that we want to tackle. But we should agree that government should be open and accessible, that people have the right to know what information government has, uh, what records uh, uh, government uh, keeps, and what was the basis for decisions. And open government should always be seen as a, an American issue, not a Democrat or a Republican issue. Um, and, you know, when you take a look at the issue of technology, obviously it's, it's one of the major ingredients for open government. Technology uh, can be a powerful platform for making information more accessible. Um, but it's also something that links up to government efficiency. Uh, you can embrace technology to deliver services. In the 1990s, I was active in promoting the Klinger Cohen Act, which was, you think about it, it's like, you know, technology floaties for government, where we said to every government agency, we want you to have a chief information officer. We want you to have information technology plans. We want to talk about, uh, uh, you know, what you're spending on technology and how does that relate to your core business and how you're going to transform. And then by the 2000s, um, once we'd gotten past uh, the, the uh, Y2K issue, and we had a Y2K czar and John Koskinen, uh, we uh, started looking at um, the president's management agenda under the Bush administration for how do you use technology to deliver services, the eGov initiatives uh, that each agency was asked to set, stand up to make government services more affordable, accessible, uh, to deliver actual government services online. Uh, but one of the things, though, that I think has lagged is the use of technology on the open government space. Uh, and this should be so easy. I mean, you're not delivering a product or service. You're just providing something that the American people should have, which is a line of sight and transparency into what records are being uh, kept, uh, what uh, uh, data and information is being uh, used to, to, in essence, run the government and to justify policy choices. Um, uh, and technology can do that very easily. And I think the reason why we're not using it is because there is a resistance in government to sharing uh, information and being open. So, so the, the, I'm sorry, it was the Klinger... Klinger Cohen. Klinger Cohen. Yes, yeah, Senator uh, Cohen and Congressman Klinger uh, in the 1990s passed this important piece of legislation. It was one of the first laws on information technology usage in the federal government. And was that when you were at the, the performance? Uh, That's when I worked on, uh, on, on it, uh, government reform issues on Capitol Hill. Okay. Uh, and again, we worked uh, closely with uh, the reinventing government uh, team that Al Gore had set up. Um, Gore had decided, I think as a mistake, to set up NPR, National Partnership for Reinventing Government, outside of the Office of Management and Budget. They had their own offices, their own teams, their own manuals and policy and, 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 and uh, ideas. Uh, my view, and I think, um, I think uh, many agree, is that you have to link management reform to the budget. It's the golden rule. If you tie something to money, It'll get done in government. And so by divorcing management reform from OMB, I think that was a critical mistake in the Clinton administration. And then in the Bush administration, the goal was to try to fuse management reform with budget decisions. Uh, and um, uh, uh, I think that that ultimately is good as long as you also have co congressional buy-in for some of those management changes. One of the big obstacles that we're seeing is that an administration, the Obama administration has several management initiatives as well, an administration can offer ideas on how to manage the departments, but if that's not also reinforced from Congress, if Congress uh, in terms of appropriations and authorization of programs isn't supporting that, 
then you have basically mixed signals and the bureaucracy waits out the administration and says, well, you're going to go in four years. Or the political appointees change every two years, pretty much, this is a cycle. So career staff who have to implement e-government projects will kind of wait out uh, the administration and so you don't see a whole lot of traction it's on It's interesting that. that you say that um, because it, it, it sounds like you think that uh, the people in the departments are gonna gonna be very opposed to, to instituting new tools and new systems. It's, it's, it, it, do you think that's a universal? Um, or or is there a way to, to bring those people who are in the departments who obviously have knowledge about how things should work to bring them in and, and get them working towards more efficient and, and more technological government. That was the whole concept behind Performance Institute. And the goal there was, in a um, non-threatening way, approach government managers and say, um, hey, there are ideas on how you can improve the management of your programs. Mm -hmm. And yes, we're going to talk about the politics of what OMB wants and what the Hill is doing, but mainly we want to give you tools that will improve your ability to manage your program and to not just comply but to actually improve performance. And so we always approached it that way, and the goal was to identify how on a career level, civil service level, things were happening that then you could have peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, but I do think that we, we've not seen enough interest on the part of Congress, and this, is all, this has always been my uh, criticism in both Democrat and Republican um, congressional regimes, is that members of Congress are about policy. Um, they're not a whole lot about oversight and evaluation of programs. Uh, it's very rare. Uh, and the only time that you see that happening is when there's a scandal. And they say, oh, gosh, we just found this out. So, you know, we're on it. We're on it. Let's have oversight hearings. Well, you know, we have this entire set of programs in every department that you should evaluate, you know, perhaps even once every five years. And we've got the great support organization called the General Accounting Office, and every department has an inspector general. Um, so that's going to be important is congressional oversight. But back to open government, having these records available allow citizens to perform their own level of we, oversight we and, do our own and members of the media. So, um, you know, this was a frustrating thing for me in, in city council. As a member of the city council, I sometimes did not feel that I could get information. And my, my uh, collaborator on open government, Donna Fry, felt the same way. Uh, as though, you know, we were trying to get information. Uh, in, in San Diego, we have the Public Records Act mm -hmm. request uh, process. But if you don't ask the question exactly the right way, then you may not get the answer that you're looking for. Um, and they also then turn around and say, well, certain records are not subject to the PRA uh, process. My view is, and it's I've always done this in my office, and I challenge anyone to come up with an example that where it hadn't happened. Um, if someone asks for public records, I search my private emails. My view on a public record is if whether it was sent from a government server or a private server, if the record related to my duties to vote on something as a council member, government services, it's a public record, period, end of story. But right now, the PRA is very narrowly written to say that it has to originate from a government server to be classified as a government document. My, I, I think that we need to have a challenge in court on that, uh, and if necessary, an amendment to the law. My view has always been, no matter what util, you, tool you utilize, if it relates to your uh, official business, if it's a matter that you're voting on, it's a government or ministerial uh, document, no matter where it originated, whether it's on the back of a napkin or it's uh, on AOL uh, as an email system. So um, with that in mind, uh, rather than have the PRA process at all, I think what a lot of us want to do is just get these things out in the open. Put it online. Yeah. So, you know, why not have email automatically released to the public without a PRA even needed? Um, I think that... Uh, that, if we could provide the technology to allow for, you know, universal searches, I think mm -hmm. that because it is a government, um, it's a government undertaking, I think that that's something that we should consider. Uh, my open government plan um, has always included uh, taking out of the hands of managers the compliance on these issues. Uh, and so in the city of San Diego, I said the city auditor should be in charge of the PRAs. Um, and that if the department isn't providing information, the auditor will go and say, we're the auditors, we're just going to take the information and we're going to comply uh, with the request. Uh, in the federal government, I'd like to see that uh, responsibility for the FOIA process transferred to inspector generals. Um, the reason why this is so important is that in this administration, uh, and I'm 
saying, uh, let me be very careful to say, the prior administrations failed, I believe, on FOIA as well. And these games are played in every administration. But this administration came in committing to full transparency, and we have not seen that. Um, and so I, what I want to see is a process um, where there's a timeline, uh, where there is clear um, standards for uh, uh, whether a document can be withheld, mm -hmm. and that um, uh, we remove the conflict of interest in providing a, an ombudsman for FOIA uh, in each department, and that should be the inspector general. I've also proposed that Congress live under the FOIA law as well. And this is going to be very hard. Uh, <laughs> people say, well, you know, members of Congress don't want you to know who they're meeting with. Well, I think that would be quite enlightening. Who are you meeting with? And, um, you know, what are the documents, the source documents that you're using to craft legislation? Um, what are your constituents saying about their challenges and their issues uh, in the district? These are issues that, again, should be done in, in an open platform. And Congress, if Congress feels that we should have FOIA for the executive branch, we should also live under the same laws uh, in the legislative branch. Makes sense to me. Um, I want to uh, go back to your time on the city council. Uh, you, uh, uh, you you did one thing with technology in particular that sticks in my mind. The was pothole it? app. No, it's not the pothole. App. <laughs> it's People not the pothole. say it's the pothole app because uh, one of the one of the services was pothole. But if you took, take a look at San Diego three one one and what we did is we looked at every city service. Um, the funniest one was we had dead animal removal on there, and someone took a picture of certain city council members and submitted them as <laughs> dead animal removal. Um, but look, you know, when I proposed that, the city bureaucracy was furious. Uh, originally, my proposal was a 311 uh, CRM package mm -hmm. for, um, in the early 2000s, I said, look, we have all these call centers. We use different CRM packages. Why don't we have one telephone number, 311? one CRM package, and then online people can go take a ticket number and see where their request is. Um, well, by 2009, when I was um, in office, uh, my idea was leaped by, by, by technology because now we had a mobile platform, and it allowed us to uh, use GPS so that if you have a, a, a leaky uh, a fire hydrant or you have a, a pothole or you have graffiti was a big one. We got a lot mm -hmm. of graffiti um, requests. You can take a picture, and then the technology allows us to know down to the foot where you were standing, and then you can upload that. The other thing I liked about the San Diego 311 is that you could open it up and find out who else in your neighborhood reported problems, and you got to see the pictures that they took, and you got to see the status so, of so what was, was going all public. on. It was all public. And so if you have um, you know, graffiti on a wall and it was reported six months ago and then five or six other people also reported it, wouldn't you like to know which department that's sitting on, you know, what desk you know, that's sitting on? And so San Diego 311, we did it for $9,000. I cut my own budget in my council office uh, to, to pay for that. And in uh, six months' time, the first six months of the app, we did more cases in my office with just two field reps as the entire city council had done in the previous three years combined. In six months' time. Now, the bureaucracy was like, you're flooding us with uh, requests and tickets. And my response was, uh, well, that's what we're here for. You know, The problems are still there whether they go reported or not. What San Diego 311 did was it allowed us to give an easier tool for the constituents to let us know where we need to be doing a better job. The first thing Bob Filner did when he got into office, was he shut off San Diego 311? So, question about it. I heard, once somebody submitted, is it, did I, I understand it sent an email to your office, is that correct? Is that how the workflow happened? The, the, the way it was explained to me, because I'm not attacking myself, I'm just uh, you know, looking at how we transform and how we use, yeah. uh, how we use good ideas. Um, the city's system, uh, its, its CRM system, mm -hmm. uh, was not prepared to integrate. So my two field reps basically took the information and then uploaded it into the system they're, they're, yeah. uh, using using Excel and, and you know it, there had to be a human interface mm. uh, but it also allowed us to go through and to see each week what cases were assigned and then follow up there has to be some level of human interaction uh, as part of my my plans for the city as uh, a hopeful mayor uh, we uh, had committed that we would implement the entire uh, program which would have included one telephone number one CRM system and the mobile app being fully integrated uh, but as one member of the city council we, pre we did a pretty damn good job 
So, so the the, the C CRM system that, that that the city does have, and and the fact that that essentially you had to have people doing something a machine can do. Obviously, there's a value to human oversight, but well, because the administration made it quite clear they would not integrate. They made it quite clear that they were unwilling to integrate the tool. And, and, and so we said, you know, we still think that the mobile app is so important. Uh, and we were right, because look at the number of cases that we were able to do. Um, I was also proud of the fact that our road repair rallies became the model for now what we're doing in the city. Mm -hmm. um, I announced that we would have, using our cell phone apps and also pen and paper for people who aren't so good with the cell phone, uh, that we would announce uh, a, a date certain that we would have a bunch of people show up to walk one neighborhood to look for potholes. And then we submitted all of those that week. Um, and of course, the city work crews were really apprehensive when we announced these, uh, 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 we called them road repair rallies. Well, they came back to us and they uh, said, you know, it's made our work crews far more efficient because now we, we got a bunch of pothole requests all in the same community, and it allows us to go and do it far more efficiently. The city has now learned, and as part of the um, uh, infrastructure improvements that they announced just a few months ago, the city now uses this localized, focused approach to taking a look at road, road repairs, uh, and they have a schedule for doing that uh, region by region. Um, so I, wa I want to focus a little bit more on this, this CRM that the city has, and, and really just sort of <coughs> A lot of issues that I've been seeing with the city technology, and, and you were just a council member, and, you know, you didn't control the whole thing, so I'm certainly not going to uh, put it all at your, your doorstep, but the city has been horrible at, 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 at IT procurement. And cert Absolutely. Certainly not the city, the state, the federal government. Uh, Take a look at Data Processing Corporation, and that's why I, I called <laughs> for us to do something about that in 2004. Now, I, my view was I thought we should, we should have sold DPC because it's an asset. It has equipment, it has, more importantly, workers, it has a workforce. And so my uh, original proposal was we should divest ourselves of DPC and make a profit off of we it. We should probably give people a quick sense uh, of what DPC is. San Diego Data Processing Corporation. So in the 1970s, 70s, late 70s, yeah. the city came up with a pretty neat idea. And it said, what we're going to do is we are going to spin off a nonprofit. That nonprofit will be a contractor to us uh, to provide our IT services. And basically what they wanted to do, I think a, a number of reasons why they wanted to get outside of the city pure curb mm -hmm. and uh, HR policies. If they're a nonprofit, they get to hire quickly, they get to contract quickly. A lot more flexibility. Cut through the red tape. So it totally understood. The other thing that they had proposed is that uh, this nonprofit, wholly owned by the city of San Diego, would then not only provide services to us, but they would then be a, a contractor to go out and make a profit from other regional governments in San Diego, and that the profits would be used for us. Great idea. Fast forward. <laughs> fast forward. Well, the, the culture didn't quite get that, and so they got one or two small, tiny contracts, but nothing real yeah. of substantial nature. Uh, so we didn't make any money off of this thing. Uh, but what they did do is they used it as a shell game in the budget process, where they overcharged general uh, uh, enterprise funds for their IT. Water department, wastewater department, where they could just raise your fees. And then they transferred the money to the departments where they couldn't raise your taxes, which are the general fund departments, to offset their budget shortfall. Shell game. And so by the end of this process, I think DPC um, ultimately, you know, on one level got a bad rap because uh, they were being accused of having higher prices than they should. But what was happening is that the city managers were using DPC to overcharge departments to run a surplus. And then they would find money at the end of the budget year mm -hmm. to say, oh, look at, you know, we didn't, you know, we have a budget uh, shortfall, but we found a little money here. And here's some, some extra money for, for some of these pet projects. Um, you know, I, I think that the way in which DPC was spun off was wrong. Uh, I would have still proceeded forward with um, awarding uh, a 30-year contract to DPC so that it was a revenue stream that you can then sell that corporation for profit, take the profit, put it back into the city, and then have a 30-year uh, master service arrangement and contract uh, with the successor firm. Instead, the city just decided, uh, in essence, to shut it down and then award contracts uh, outside uh, the process. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. There, there are better ways to do the IT. Uh, and IT has always been a challenge for private sector organizations, as it has for, for government. It's just that because we don't have Darwin helping us out in government, 
uh, to constantly push right. us to compete and, and to be more efficient. Um, you know, good management is hard in government. It, when you find a good, a well-managed program, it it deserves a lot of credit because Darwin was not helping that along. It took conscious effort. It took real uh, uh, strategy to, to make that happen. So, so the they ended up basically splitting DPC into three parts, breaking, and contracting it all, out. contracting yeah. it out, including to 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 uh, now infamous uh, CGI. Um, so. The exchange, the Obamacare exchange uh, provider. Yeah. Now, I, 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 I don't remember if you, how you voted on, on, on that contract. Did, did you vote for Ultimately, it? Ultimately, I voted with, with my, my commentary regarding uh, my reservations about, I think there's a better way to do this. When presented with the savings, mm -hmm. I said, all right, if this is what this administration is able to achieve, let's bank the savings and move forward. Do you now regret that, that you voted for CGI? Uh, I don't regret the savings that we achieved. I think that um, you know, when, you, when you hold someone accountable, you'll get good results. Clearly, the administration did not hold this contractor accountable for the other project, which was the Obamacare exchanges. So um, going to Congress, um, do you think CGI should, should ever get another contract from the federal government? Uh, they, they were a colossal failure when it came to the Obamacare uh, website. And uh, I would also say the administration shares in that failure. Um, you've got the contractor, and then you have the project or program manager, mm -hmm. uh, and both have to be held accountable. Uh, my view on, on the Obamacare exchanges, and I think I'll, this come, will come as a surprise to some folks, um, I would keep the exchanges, but I would spin them off into the private sector, and let the private sector manage and maintain the transactions. I don't think the government should have ever have been in the uh, website building uh, business. Um, and I don't think that government should be in the healthcare transaction business. That's something the private sector should use. But the benefit of the exchanges is that you're able to, to, to solve a flaw in the market, which is, as a small business owner, I always was you know, shocked by the, the healthcare rates that we were charged. Um, when I had 10 employees, we, on a per person basis, it was pretty expensive. By the time we had 180 employees, I was actually paying less per employee even three years later. Mm -hmm. um, that's the market basically saying that larger companies are going to get a, give, be given a discount. So I would keep the exchanges but would make sure that the, the, the uh, uh, website as well as the transaction uh, processing of the, uh, the purchases of, of health care would be spun off into uh, privately managed, privately uh, uh, conducted transactions. So i got to re-ask my question. Yeah. Do you think CGI should ever get a, another federal contract? I, I'm going I'm to take a wait and see approach to um, who gets contracts. I don't think that you have Congress decide on contracts. You have the administration decide on those contracts. Do you think it it should be easier on the federal level to disqualify? Oh sure. Contractors. If you have, you always want to look at past performance. Uh, but again, that's an administration decision. Now, now uh, so in looking at IT contracting on every level of government, that's actually one of the problems that. I've seen is, is, is past performance is one of the biggest uh, criteria in awarding contract. So the, the companies it's that a, get contracts... It is a big criteria. It's a lot bigger than it used to be, which is a good thing. Um, but you also have uh, uh, the issue of, of best, best value. You know, you've got your, your cost and your performance evaluation that you want to look for. Well, so in, if your past performance is also future performance. It's, it's what are you willing to provide our agency what performance standards will you maintain and achieve? Uh, past performance can be indicative of whether you feel that they can actually, you know, pull it off. But performance-based contracting, which came about in the 1990s, mm -hmm. Al Berman, one of my, my uh, supporters and, and uh, great guy, uh, it was a former OFPP administrator, Office of Federal Pro Procurement Policy, um, pushed performance-based contracting in the federal level. And we need to be embracing more of those models of fixed price performance guarantee contracting with warranties, standards, and past performance evaluation can certainly be one of the factors you use to award. Uh, but it also should be looking at what's the price and what are the performance guarantees that you're going to get from the contractor. So the, the, the problem I've seen is that if you're looking at for paving a street or building a building, that's that's tech, that's something that hasn't changed much in the last 30, 40, <coughs> maybe you know roughly a hundred years. Technology, IT, changes incredibly mm -hmm. quickly. So if you're going with a company with twenty years of technology experience, they're doing things the same way they've been doing for twenty years. You're getting a really bad product. You're getting something. Uh, are you familiar with Moore's law? 
uh, it has to do with processing power, roughly okay. that it doubles every year and a half. So if you're looking at four-year-old technology, you're looking at something that's roughly 10 times too expensive. Mm -hmm. So how do we start saying, wait, we don't want the companies with lots of experience. We want the young, agile companies who are doing things in new, cheaper, faster ways. But you're going to find, if you have performance-based contracting in the federal government, that you're going to find that the market's going to start breaking through some of those uh, barriers for us. More importantly, um, when you continue to emphasize small business goals, which is something I'm very supportive of, uh, the big guys aren't going to be able to get as many of those contracts. Uh, and so when I was on the Federal Acquisition Reform Commission, one of the big things that we were looking at was uh, how do we actually true up the achievement of small business targets <coughs> by, for each agency? How do we make sure that we prevent these primes from using a small business as a shell to then turn around and uh, take all the work. Um, and there are real significant problems there. And one of the things, I, again, as a management geek, mm -hmm. as a member of Congress, I think I can probably be a very powerful voice in asking tough questions of deputy secretaries, of making sure that we get the management teams in for our oversight hearings. It probably will bore some of my colleagues, I get it, but this is important stuff because this is where policy translates into actual implementation. Management capabilities, the decisions these agencies are making, do you have a proper acquisition workforce? Do you have a proper project management culture so that you can manage important technology projects. Uh, those are two critical issues. If you don't have good contracting uh, processes and management as well as program uh, abilities, it doesn't matter who your contractor is, you can end up having pretty bad results. Um, those are the issues that are not sexy, but those are issues that Congress ought to be asking about. So I want to change gears here a little bit and, and, and ask you about um, going to D.C. and, 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 and your, your colleagues in Congress. Um, I think you and I are probably pretty similar politically. Um, <coughs> I'm a centrist as well. C centrist, uh, uh, liberal on social issues, conservative on economic issues. Responsible and uh -huh. accepting. Uh, you know, uh -huh. let's, let's get past some of the labels when the people say, well, you're socially liberal. I'm socially accepting. I'm fiscally responsible. Let's let's get past the liberal conservative uh, dynamics, and I think you're going to find when you talk about where your positions are, you'll find a lot more common ground even between the two parties. So this is a pretty. There, I think there's a lot of us in San Diego. Uh, DC seems like it's it obviously has people from all around the country, but apart from all those other things, you you also seem very focused on facts, on what is the reality. Now let's analyze this based on. You know, what does work, what doesn't work. And there, there seems to be a culture in D.C. almost of, <coughs> for lack of a better phrase, playing politics with the truth. Um, and, and uh, you know, I... I just, people say uh, if, uh, uh, you'll believe it when you see it. Some people in politics see it when they believe it. And that's the thing that we have to battle against is... Um, it can be very frustrating. It can be very damaging uh, to not only uh, uh, policies that we're trying to iron out and, and get right, but to people's lives. So, so how are you? How are you going to do that? How are you going to bring some of the people who, you know, some of your colleagues who deny climate change and you know want to micromanage scientists yeah. and you know won't uh, you know I, and and those of us in, in technology. We, we have the same thing every day with clients who are trying to explain them that, no, that's, this is a hard technological problem. This is an easy one. Yeah. The, 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 the almost... Uh, you, you have to try to appeal to them kind of where they are. Let me talk to you about two conversations I had, both on pension reform. One was January 2009. I was in office for a month. Firefighters Union opposed me attacked me when I ran for city council. They actually ran a firefighter. Yeah, you were running against a firefighter. Let's be fair. No, 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 no. They put a firefighter in the race oh, okay. because my other opponents had dropped out. Um, so they come in and, you know, I got Alan Alvarado and Frank DeClerc and a couple other guys there. And I said, look, you know, um, uh, you know, thanks for taking this meeting. Um, I want to talk about pension reform. 
you know, we got some of the pleasantries out of the way, which was real quick with the fire union. <laughs> and uh, I said, look, um, we're going to have to shut down the pension system. We're going to have to move to defined contributions. Uh, we are going to have to deal with the current liabilities by finding some way to reform existing benefits for employees. Current retirees, I don't think we're going to be able to touch that legally, but we're going to have to go after both existing employee benefits and reform those, as well as new hires. That's the reality, because we're not sustainable. There's no mathematical way to solve this, to drag it out. My only question to you is, how painful are you going to make it, and how long are you going to force it to take? They didn't like that. But in the end, that's where we ended up. And it was relatively painful for the city. When I went to uh, the police union, I had the same message of we need to work on pension reform. And I uh, talked to board members in the unions and as well as members. Um, you know, I'll always stop sending employees and I'll talk to them about their job. And of course, pensions come up and, you know, why do you want to take my pension away? And why do you, you know, hate firefighters or whatnot? And I'd say, come on, you know, here's why I'm doing this because I want to know that your retirement is secure. And I kept going back to, is there any area where we have common ground? They want to have secure retirements. They want to make sure we recruit and retain, they say, that we can recruit and retain more talent. Uh, we talked about flexible uh, you know, benefit packages and uh, being able to have more take-home pay when you have an opt-out program uh, and a hybrid model. Covered all the ground, and for some folks, they were open to it. You know, they don't want the benefits to go away. The funniest thing was finally when we sat down at the bargaining table in, in August of 2012 when my initiative passed, the unions that had spent months demanding Social Security, demanding it, you don't put Social Security in there. Uh, and I said all along, I'm going to let the unions decide whether they want to go back into Social Security. And what we're doing is we're capping our exposure and our contribution. But this is something that's subject to meet and confer. I want them to be able to be part of it. When we sat down, initially they said, we want Social Security plus 401k. And I said, wait, 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 wait. I want to show the, you the facts. The actuaries are going to come in and show you if we give you a 3% 401k plus a 6.2% fixed annuity or even a 9.2% 401k. Over 30 years, here's what the replacement ratio would be for your income when you retire. And the goal was to get to 65%, which is what the experts say. Well, we got to 72% under that model. We then said, all right, now we're going to simulate it based on Social Security. 47% was what they achieved. And then I kind of said, by the way, this assumes that the politicians keep their end of the bargain. Do you really want to make that bet? Every single one of the unions took those numbers to their members and came back saying, we don't want to be part of Social Security. In fact, Ben Hueso tried carrying a bill. I think he actually passed it, but we blew it out in court. Um, he carried a bill, and the unions locally originally supported the bill, mandating that we go to Social Security. And then when they saw the numbers, they flipped on him and opposed the bill, saying, no, 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 let us figure this out locally. And ultimately, we reached unanimous agreement and implemented our labor contract in August of 20, 2012. I was willing to talk to the unions and appeal to them based upon what I thought they were interested in and try to get facts to them. My opponent's running a spliced video of me talking to the Tea Party. If you watch the full video, this is what I said. I stood up there and I said, I want to talk to you about the most important issue facing our city. And I believe that instead of focusing on all these other issues, that your best impact can be locally. I need your help for pension reform. Now. I told that to Democrat groups, I told that to Latino groups, I told that to Asian Pacific Islander groups. I, my message is the same no matter what my audience is, which is, here's this challenge called pension reform, and I'm going to provide you some evidence and data as to why I think you should be interested in it, and I need your help. And let's get this done. I'm willing to work with anyone. I'll go to the Skyline Church, Jim Garlow, who's saying that I'm unfit for office because I'm gay. I'm willing to show up at Skyline and be present. Why? Because I believe that some people might change their views on gay people if they see myself and my partner having a loving relationship, being normal. You know, giving people that information and saying, look, we have family values too. Uh, and you say you're for family values. So I have no problem going into the belly of the beast and trying to find common ground and saying, here's some things that we can work on. Donna Fry and I disagree on a lot of issues, but we agree strongly on open government issues. It's one of the first things I reached out to her on, and we got a lot done together. Donna Fry and I also agreed that the downtown redevelopment agencies were taking more than their fair share. 
and it was time for them to pay back. And when people, you know, belittled us for our reforms, even some of my biggest backers that I had to take on in the development community, the new city hall project, uh, defunding CCDC on some of these big projects, they uh, opposed both of us, but we were successful in advancing it. Again, I look not for where we disagree. I look for some things that we may agree on and then try to marshal some data to convince people that, yes, this is in alignment with the goals that you're trying to achieve on these issues. We can disagree on 80% of things, but if we agree on 20%, why don't we just check the box and get the 20% done? That's the philosophy I hope to see in, in Washington. So a long response to your question of how am I going to try to engage in Washington is I'm going to try to take that same approach to engaging people on where we do agree and saying, if we agree on these issues, let's just get them done. We'll fight about the rest later, but let's get these things done. I, I was afraid this was going to happen. We're having too good of a conversation. We're running tight Sorry on time. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask you a couple of things, uh, some of the big tech issues on the yep. federal level. Uh, and as, as I'll be as, quiet. I'll be very short. Yeah, let's try okay. and do one, one sentence response to these. Um, the mass surveillance uh, by the I'm CIA. opposed to it. You have the constitutional right to due process. Um, and look, a judge will, will, will offer a search warrant uh, based on the scantiest of evidence. So um, I want to make sure that people have to get a search warrant in the federal government before they look at your emails or your cell phone records. And what about metadata, so-called metadata? The data analytics and the metadata, uh, again, I... I I just don't believe that that is a tool that um, should be used uh, uh, without some sort of search warrant, some sort of stricter criteria. Okay. Uh, net neutrality. 100% for net neutrality, and I'm not going to waffle on it or send code words like my opponent. Um, uh, use of open source in government. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out uh, where we go uh, on that front, but I think that uh, I'm inclined to support it. We'll have a longer conversation okay. after the election. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, digital rights management. Digital rights management. Is that you know, you know, uh, copyright and, and whatnot? Ba basically building into devices copyright protections and, and, and controlling the ability to, say, uh, uh, freely share uh, a document, a, a Well, a I'm a song. big property rights guy, and so I want to make sure that we don't infringe upon property rights. Um, but that's important to me. Okay. We'll have a further conversation All about right. that one, too. Um, and then finally, um, uh, scientific research that the government pays for, um, uh, making it openly available. Why not? It's taxpayer-funded mm, research. That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Is that a trick one? Uh, it shouldn't be, but it's Congress. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, um, I, the, the, the last thing I want to ask, and then I wanted to leave some time for, for questions, was um, you've talked a lot about openness. You've talked a lot about transparency. You've talked about making yourself available to everybody, which made me feel much less excited about getting you to come here. Um, <laughs> I no longer feel special, um, <laughs> but um, all right. But but uh, your own experiences on the council in this race, um, um, I I've heard that you've been um, not totally accessible to the press. Um, well, uh, th there's a difference. I'm accessible to my constituents, and I want to make sure that my constituents get honest, unbiased information. And what we've been able to do in this digital age is provide information to individuals, uh, to constituents, in a far more powerful way by going door to door, by holding town halls and community coffees and being accessible over email. Um, we work very hard in my team, and I pride myself on the fact that I'm always out there. Um, if you have a media outlet that simply cannot demonstrate that they're interested in providing fair and balanced coverage, then we've got to prioritize that. And, and I don't you know, regret that because I want to make sure that when people hear from me that they know, okay, this is a reputable news source that is going to provide the facts in a balanced way. Uh, otherwise, in this new technology age, and I love the fact that this is happening, in this new technology age, people are able to get information directly from the source. They can go to my website. They can go to my community coffee. They can talk to me in a teletown hall. They, they have the ability to actually get actual source data, and that's, I think, transformative. Now, a lot of old media companies are not liking that. They feel that they are the arbiters of what the public needs to know. I, I disagree. 
Uh, if we have a, a media outlet that's uh, uh, fair and, and honest in their reporting, they will always get a priority response from us. If you have a media outlet that's just muckracking and not interested in the truth, then, you know, I've got to prioritize our, our team's time in terms of making sure that our constituents get full information, uh, factual information. So I won't ask you to name names about who, who's muckraking in town, but um, I, 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 it does raise one last question before I open it up to do you. Do you think that the public doesn't get that there's a media bias? I think they all get it. And so what we try to do, and, and you're never going to like all your stories. I can guarantee you no, no. one's always going to like all their stories. And I'll see a story from a, a news outlet that we're like, you know, we don't really think that they're, they're, they're too balanced. And I'll say, wow. That surprised me. It was a very balanced story. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we look at each story one by one. Nobody has a complete blanket, you know, uh, you know, we don't work with these groups. But we look at the story, the nature of the story, um, kind of the angle that they're going for, the type of reporter that we're working with, and we say, okay, you know, let's engage on, on this story because we feel that this is a, a topic that, that this news organization is legitimately trying to cover in a fair, transparent, and open way. So, so um, and, and there's certainly, I, I, I love the internet. I love the ability to have conversations. I've had several conversations with you over Twitter. I think you and Lorena Gonzalez are the two most active and engaging politicians locally on, on, on Twitter. And that's great, but, but I also see that, that a lot of that stuff tends to be very superficial. It can get very nasty. Um, and my missing. staff really like me staying off of Twitter. <laughs> by the way, they, they, <laughs> you know, you know, and, and you know, some of our tweets are, are pre-programmed, mm -hmm. um, and and it's it's basically us saying here are some information, here's some important issues that we're trying to raise. We want to drive the debate on these issues, um, and so you have pre-programmed uh, use of social media, but then also there's interaction. We'll see something that's that's unique, that's something that I'm interested in. That I want to interact with directly. Uh, I author all of our tweets. I, I, they propose them, and and the staff know kind of mm -hmm. what I want to say. I don't write every single tweet that's put out, but I write a, a, probably what, fifty percent of them. Yeah, about fifty percent of them. Uh, the rest are here are the issues I want to advance. Make sure that you draft it in a way that reflects my position. Thus far, we haven't had any embarrassing tweets, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure you know what. It's I'm happen. sure in time it will happen. And you know what? Um, you know that's part of a, when you're working in a large organization. Um, you want to make sure that um, you give people flexibility and freedom. And from time to time, they'll make mistakes. But uh, we're a learning organization, and, and I've I've always established that as you know, try new things. Uh, I want you to be empowered to do do your job. Well, well I really should, I, I have lots more questions, but let, let me open it up to the audience. Uh, questions about technology, about open and I need government? to make sure that you get me on time, right? Okay. <laughs> Go for it. Go ahead. So if you're, we talk about open <coughs> government data, open government public oversight over government operations. Uh, with your time and experience on the city council, it's all well and good to say that you just want to open a big portal and let people go in and plumb for the data that they find is important in government. Um, and there's also some functions of government that need to be not public. You know, somebody sues the city because a cop did something appropriate. All of those things are already protected. From, it's pre-decisional information, and all of the, we have standards in place to to address that issue. Are those are there conversations say between council members or between council members and departments? Are the message, messages covering those subjects existing in the city email system where there'd be some complexity and try to keep things uh, partitioned? Or no. if there is a portal into the city, in a, a data portal into the city, there's literally no risk to having things that need to remain confidential. We can work out protocols, all right? And you don't have to go full bore overnight. Right. We can create, um, you know, uh, a wave of, of implementation milestones. But, uh, for example, my Sunshine Act that passed in uh, October of 2012 required uh, uh, employee uh, compensation to be posted online. It required contracts to be posted online, uh, the number of bids received, because I was very interested in making sure that are we giving no bid contracts? Are we giving one bid, you know, or, or you know, small bids? Are we getting uh, 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 small business to be participating or veterans to be participating? So getting the contracting information posted online. Uh, I really pushed hard to get schedules posted online, but my colleagues didn't want to go that far. Uh, and so, 
it's it's always uh, I think that when you talk about open government, you don't have to have a hundred percent overnight. What you can do is say, okay, here are thoughtful things to implement and make accessible online. Let's evaluate the use of it. Let's evaluate um, what potential roadblocks we have, and then we can continue to make uh, improvements from there. Yes. Um, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Congressman Peters last night. Um, so some argue that some amount of like closed door deals are necessary in government in order to move forward with legislative action. Like I use the example of the Constitutional Convention. Um, you know, the public accepted some degree of secrecy um, during the time of the Constitutional Convention. So do you think that argument? still holds in the current political environment or yeah current political environment um not really. Uh, so part of what I'm doing with Fixed Congress First is that we have the single subject rule. A lot of times the, the uh, issue is shrouded and there's no transparency or accountability because something's buried in a bill. So single subject rule would require that <clears throat> we vote on each bill one by one. Here's another open government issue. Access to floor time and a, in a, uh, being able to call a vote. Right now you have Harry Reid who's Mr. Obama's veto. And then you have uh, Boehner in the Le House Republican leadership who is Mr. Obama's roadblock, you know. Uh, both sides basically hold hostage uh, bills from the other chamber. Um, you know, ENDA is important to me. I want to get that done. I think if we called ENDA up for a vote, it would pass. I think if you called a bunch of b bills up for a vote on the House floor, they would all pass. But because one side wants to hold that issue hostage, to get 100% of what they want on something else or 100% of their direction on that issue, um, neither chamber really is open. So I'm proposing that we lower the threshold for fl floor consideration to 25% of the members supporting a bill. If you have 25% of the members supporting a bill, you get 15 minutes of floor time and a recorded vote. I don't fear debating something I don't agree with. I don't fear voting against it. But I should agree that I would defend your right to offer the idea. That's open government. Uh, that's going to be really hard for me to, to get done. I get yeah, I'm, I'm but, trying to decide how do you get that to a vote. <laughs> but you know what? But laying it out there and saying, look, we have gridlock in Washington. You guys are at 7% approval ratings. It sounds like you really need to have an extreme makeover. And part of that is opening up your process for people being able to offer ideas. Uh, another uh, issue is uh, making sure that legislation is posted for real online 72 hours ahead of time so we can, at least the public can read the bill first. Um, so these are all things that uh, I believe will open up the process so that you don't have that backroom dealing that's always going on. Um, and uh, that people have trust and confidence that they're seeing all the issues uh, in, in public light before people are making decisions. Uh, One more question the mayor has announced a big website redesign initiative for the city and I'm wanting to get your thoughts on how you think the website can do a better job for um, all of its stakeholders and what you see as some of the potential barriers of getting the best job done. We mentioned CGI and how the debacle with the Obamacare website and you mentioned you know $9,000 to develop a, the 311 app which was pretty successful but yeah knowing that that couldn't integrate with I drive a hard bargain. Yeah, yeah. They, no. they, at first they asked for 50 grand, and I'm like, no, you're not getting that. And they wanted that annually, and I, was, yeah. I, drew, I negotiated. I'm glad that they're doing the website project in the city. It's long overdue. Um, the city has been a lag, uh, a laggard when it comes to uh, embracing uh, e-commerce. Um, but what I want to do is think about this. Don't build a website to take your brick and mortar process and digitize it. Rethink your process to deploy it on uh, the internet. Um, you know, the big mistake I've seen in a lot of e-government projects is that they try mapping their existing workflow and then taking that and presenting some sort of portal into that. It's an our mess for less, in essence, is the online project. Um, fix your brick and mortar process and then use the internet to paradigm leap that process uh, and to, to deliver the service faster, better, cheaper. My hope is that they have that philosophy on this web project as they're going forward. And you don't have to do the entire set of city services overnight. You can do it piecemeal, uh, department by department. One last question. Go back to federal issues. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you're in support of um, of uh, net neutrality and forget all the many things that fall under the umbrella. What's 
what everybody's focused on on net neutrality right now is the FCC considering whether they're going to to use their powers at, to regulate the internet like a utility. Uh, that's under consideration right now, and it's it's the next thing going. And I, I, when you say you are in favor of net neutrality, uh, it would be very easy for someone to hear you saying, "I think that the FCC should regulate the internet like a utility." Is that your position, or do you have a more nuanced approach? Um, I don't believe that we should see uh, agencies, or sorry, uh, competitors, putting their thumb on the scale on the internet. Uh, it, to basically monetize access to content. Um, and whatever legislation uh, or whatever rulemaking needs to occur to prevent that from happening, I would support. Um, I think there's a number of different avenues to get there. Uh, and so the goal is net neutrality. My commitment's net neutrality. As a Republican, I think uh, that's kind of unique um, from what I'm hearing from some of my colleagues. And I kind of sit back and say, well, if we're for free markets, free minds, this should be an easy one. This should be kind of in our wheelhouse, in our philosophy. But then again, on the social issues, they don't seem to be free markets, free minds uh, <laughs> on that. So I, I think we have some philosophical um, um, consistencies to try to work out. If, if, assuming we have a Republican majority in the House and the Senate, this is going to be important for me to uh, take on as, as, an, as one of the freedom issues uh, that um, I think I'll be successful in, in advancing a case on. Carl, thank, thank you so much Thanks for, for the invite. The time. Thanks for the invite. And uh, don't be shy about offering ideas. Uh, you know, and some of these topics I'm still trying to grapple with. And, uh, you know, I don't really have a specific step-by-step -step plan on how I'd like to proceed on them. Uh, but as you come up with ideas, if you see things in the federal government that either are on a technology basis or open government basis, you think that I can be helpful in being a champion on, don't assume I know about it. Probably I don't. So... Bring it to my attention. Let me know. Tweet at me. Email me. Uh, uh, and I'd be happy to, to take the idea under consideration. Thank you.